Hello, I'm Simon Kennan, editor of Interventional Cardiology Review, and I'm here with James Spratt, uh, an interventional cardiologist from Scotland, to talk about chronic total occlusion intervention. James, thanks for coming along. Pleasure to be here, Simon. Um, so I'm an interventional cardiologist. Uh, I don't do CTO, and looking at the uh, CTO grounds from the outside, what I see is amazing technical advances over the last five to 10 years, but there are concerns about complication rates, times of procedures, etc., and the absence of uh, evidence of benefit. So if we can just go through these issues one by one. So technical advances, I remember five, 10 years ago, everyone said my success rate with a CTO was 70%. In fact, everyone was about 50%. If you're a, an experienced CTO operator these days, what is your success rate? Yeah, so that's probably one of my pet hit questions. I think success rates and um, numbers have bedeviled this uh, area for some time. And the most important thing when you're looking at <coughs> success rates is the denominator. Yeah. So it's your um, case selection that determines whether or not you can realistically say your numbers are worthwhile. So. If you take the argument, you start off with 100 patients who have an indication for revascularization, and you say, okay, of those 100 patients, I could probably treat 10 of them, and then you get seven of those interventions actually open, your success rate you will be quoting people is 70%. Your actual success rate is 7%. And actually, those, are, those numbers that I've just talked about are very analogous to the kind of numbers we see in registry data of what actually happens so I think realistically nowadays with the technologies and the proper training, you can expect success rates in excess of 90% mm -hmm. without case selection. And um, you mentioned 70% and 50%. We did actually a paper uh, in the UK in which we um, uh, audited six centers in the UK and looked at their success rates before a training period. And we audited them six months after a training period. Before the training period, we found that 80% of the CTOs they were treating were less complex CTOs, and 20% were more complex CTOs. Of the less complex CTOs, that figure that you mentioned, 70%, was the number that we saw of success rate. Of the more complex, it was easily less than 50%, and mm -hmm. probably closer to 30%. Mm -hmm. So after a six-month training period, we could increase their success rates in the easy CTOs to getting up towards 90, and in the complex ones, up to about 70. Okay. And that comes from not telling them how to use wires better because, you know, interventional cardiologists base their whole lives around wire-based skills, but it comes from teaching them new strategies, mm -hmm. the ones you refer to, the techniques of dissection re-entry, retrograde, and uh, putting that, those together within a matrix which we refer to as the hybrid algorithm. So with the proper training, the proper concentration of case volume, case selection, I think 90% uh, of all comer CTOs is, is achievable. And in fact, uh, just to kind of evidence-base that, we published a paper in, in Heart uh, just last week, actually, in which our success rates across uh, 10 UK centres was 90%, okay. with an average complexity score of uh, 2.8, whereas where, where zero equals easy, five equals hard. So with complex lesions, high success rates. Okay, excellent. Um, Duration of procedures. I know it's a, it's a movable feast. In the registries or in your experience, what is the sort of average or the range of duration of yes. CTO procedures you're doing? So, so we have a, a, a registry database. We have two and a half thousand CTOs in it. So I don't have to guesstimate what the range of procedures I can tell you. So okay. our average procedural duration is 90 minutes and okay. our range standard deviation is about 20 minutes. So one of the barriers, as you quite correctly said at the start, was this perception that CTOs take forever. And they clog up our busy labs so that we don't have time to do our STEMIs or NSTEMIs, that volume of patients. So one of the things that uh, you know, prospective use of these newer techniques does is it constricts the procedural time whilst maintaining procedural efficiency and procedural safety. So actually, even though we're doing very complex cases, we, the vast majority are done under, under two hours. And if you were looking just at retrograde cases, would that be the same? Yeah, I mean, there's no r r real difference. I think the, the thing to say about retrograde 
is that the rationale to do cases retrogradely is based on anatomical factors. Mm -hmm. A lot of those anatomical factors are also markers of complexity. Mm -hmm. So most retrograde cases tend to be more complex. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, um, they can be longer, they can be a slightly higher use of contrast, slightly higher use of radiation, but that's a marker not of retrograde per se, but of the complexity of the anatomy. Okay. So say, for example, you had a straightforward case that you could do antigrade or retrograde, the retrograde attempt would be just as quick as the antigrade attempt. Okay. All right. Good. So you brought up radiation and contrast. Um, so what's average contrast use? So average contrast use in the registry was 220 mils. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, pretty respectable. I think uh, we, um, you know, prospectively addressed the barriers of C2 intervention about six years ago, or the perceptual barriers. Some are real barriers, some are perceptual. All of the real barriers, we felt radiation was definitely a, a limiter. And we felt that contrast could be considered a limiter and associated with morbidity of CIN and so on. Uh, safety, which we'll come along to in a bit, was definitely a consideration. And time was a consideration. Mm -hmm. So contrast, actually, uh, for CTO-PCI, we get our best information at the start of the procedure with dual injections. During the procedure itself, actually, we almost mandate against antigrade injection of contrast. Occasionally, we need retrograde contrast to uh, kind of uh, orientate equipment, etc. But often, the equipment itself gives you anatomical yeah. orientation. Yeah. And then again, you want your, your contrast at the end. So contrast use is less of an issue than you might think. Yeah. And I find because of this focus on contrast as a potential issue, that I'm actually using a lot less contrast than many of my colleagues just doing simple PCI. So again, looking at your registry, what was the incidence of people requiring dialysis after a procedure? Oh, absolutely minuscule. Okay. So, I mean, dialysis, I have a separate kind of database of patients where I take the renal function before and at, and at three days post-procedure, and that's because of an anecdotal episode of dialysis, uh, which happened many years ago, and I thought, I don't want to repeat that mistake. And within C2PCI, I think dialysis, if there's one case out of the 2,000, that would okay. be it. Min minuscule, yeah. All right. Radiation? Radiation, again, and that's one of these issues that has become a less of an issue with time. Partly it's because we've constricted the time of procedure. Our average skin dose is about 2.6 gray. That's our average skin dose. Um, we have a reporting threshold in, uh, in Edinburgh where I do my interventions of five gray. Mm -hmm. Last year we had reported one patient mm -hmm. and that, that his uh, dose was 5.3 gray. Okay. So that was the maximum dose in a year. So, and the average was 2.6? 2.6. Okay, so compare that to uh, a diagnostic angiogram. How much would a diagnostic angiogram be? Oh, diagnostic angiogram would be um, about 0.3 or something like that. A lot less, you know. Okay. So a, a standard intervention, it depends a little bit on, as you know, there are many factors, most of which uh, you can modify a bit with angles and so on, but um, patient factors are also very important. Mm -hmm. So large patients, uh, you increase the skin dose quite substantially, but... Um, an intervention you'd expect to probably a standard type A lesion less than a grey of skin dose, you would think. Okay. Safety issues, um, tamponade, stroke, death, I guess, are the issues we need to look at. So anecdotally, first of all, my experience in doing 10 years of CTOs with a high CTO volume, you, you know, probably 300 CTOs a year, um, uh, you, I have had three tamponades in 10 years. Okay. Yeah. The first of those was an elementary mistake in which I gave tarifibin post-procedure and a wire perf, and the other two were uh, collateral-related perforations. Okay. So um, very low incidence, actually, but most of that's because of our high threshold of concern. So one of the th ways we've tried to, and I'll give you the numbers in the registry in a second, one of the ways we've tried to reduce uh, those issues of perforation, particularly collateral perforation, is by prospective use of anti-grade dissection re-entry uh, uh, as a strategy where retrograde was thought to be hazardous. So anti-grade dissection re-entry is where you use uh, dedicated equipment to bypass the occlusion and re-enter the distal true lumen. That actually takes away the risk of collateral related perforation because that can be an issue. In our registry, we see a, probably a perforation rate, um, headline perforation rate between six and 8%. Okay. That's 
primarily 90% LS grade one and two. So and most of that is small perforations in the septum which have no clinical sequelae and are irrelevant. In terms of LS grade three perforations, they're the ones that half the time they lead to tamponade and uh, need for pericardial synthesis. And that's easily less than 1%. Okay, good. Death, stroke. So uh, I can tell you overall MACE. We, again, we've got a paper which has gone in um, for submission at the moment in which we've followed up a thousand patients to a year. Our overall MACE is less than 9%. Okay. So, and that includes TVR, stroke, MACE, all those things. That's a very complex lesion subset again. It's a lot of these patients haven't even been offered revascularization before. So we think that's uh, pretty respectable numbers for um, clinical efficacy at a year. All right, that's all the bad stuff. So the good stuff, um, so evidence of benefit. So I guess we need to look at symptomatic benefit, maybe improvement in LV function mm -hmm. and improvement in mm -hmm. prognosis longevity. Yeah, so we start off with symptoms, I think, because let's face it, for elective intervention, that's what we do, bread and butter. We don't give pause for concern in treating a tight right coronary artery if the gentleman has angina or the lady has angina. So in terms of quality of life benefits, uh, there isn't any difference with CTO-PCI and, uh, uh, and uh, standard percutaneous intervention. Most of the papers have come out of uh, Mid-America Heart Institute. The lead author was Aaron Grantham, and they've done QL pre and post procedure. And they found that actually the same benefit in terms of um, walk tests, in terms of QOL, in terms of relief of angina. Uh, for our cohort at a year, uh, the, the average Canadian class angina was three, and we had 90% uh, at grade one or below at a year. Okay. So in terms of durability of benefit, it seems to be there. Um, in terms of um, uh, other factors like um, sort of improvement of LB function, ischemic uh, burden and so on. There are mechanistic studies out there about uh, particularly driven, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, a stress MRI study out there. Uh, there's also a, a perfusion scan study showing that the biggest determinant of whether or not it improves L LV function is the LV function at baseline. Mm -hmm. So what surprises a lot of people with CTOs is that um, a lot of them, most of them, majority, haven't had an identifiable infarct before. Right. So there's, they've got it's normal LV function. So LV function. You, you don't actually improve their LV function. Uh, but those who do have impaired LV function and viability, there is at least three or four mechanistic studies out there showing improvement, dependent on the baseline function. Mm -hmm. So the smaller that is in terms of decrement, the smaller the benefit in terms of increment. Um, and ischemic burden works the same way. So if you've got no ischemic burden at baseline, you've no indication for revascularization. If you have a small ischemic burden, then you see a small benefit. If you have a big ischemic burden, you see a big benefit. Okay. And that uh, fits very nicely with the guidelines in America where they say that if you have a high ischemic burden, that's 10% or greater. Even in the absence of significant symptoms, you have a grade A indication for intervention. Okay. So we've got symptomatic benefit. What is the cost effectiveness of CTO procedures for yeah. that yeah. symptomatic benefit? Yeah, so, so I mean, we don't really have brilliant data on that in the same way as we don't have brilliant data on elective intervention in terms of cost benefit. And I think that's partly because it's, it's our healthcare system has problems with tracking that kind of information. So we can, we can track quite easily um, what it costs to do an intervention. What we can't track is the cost of that subsequent patient's course. So we can't give you an accurate figure of what a readmission costs, or what a clinic costs, or what medication costs, or what even, if you want to go to that extreme, what days lost of work costs. We don't have any good way of tracking that information. To my mind, that's probably the, the single biggest thing that we need to work on as a community. And that's not just for CTO, it's for a complete revask, it's for any form of elective intervention. We don't really have good enough data to say, actually, spending this amount of money at time point A will actually benefit you by time point B or C or so on. So okay. the data is not great in that area. There is some data in, in American healthcare systems, there's data from Atlanta showing that um, uh, you know, it, it's cost effective when compared to a standard procedure, even though the initial cost is slightly higher. 
and there's a little bit of data from Kansas again, but it's how directly applicable it is to our environment is a bit more challenging to define. Okay. So what research is coming down the pipeline? Yeah, so, so the areas where we're uh, looking at with interest, one is uh, we want to understand what, what dissecting does to the artery in the long term, particularly with respect to stent healing. So we're interested in seeing, well, actually, does that mean that, this, that there's less endothelialization at time point B? So we've got a study going on at the moment called Consistent, where we have half the, pop, half the population treated by dissection methods, mm -hmm. so retrograde or anterograde, and half by wire-based methods. And we have a, an angiogram and OCT at a year, and we're going to look at stent coverage at a year. And that's randomised, is it? Uh, it's all comer data in terms of there isn't um, a randomization element to it, but we're matching them in terms of you know standard matching criteria, patient criteria. Okay. So that's kind of about 50% complete, and uh, that's going to help guide things like DIP and give us more uh, evidence in terms of duration of benefit, uh, duration of therapy, need for a re revask, et cetera. Okay. Excellent. James, thank you very much. That's very useful. Pleasure. Thanks for your time, Simon.